All right, time for part two, random field theory uh, in the parametric approaches for controlling family-wise error rate. Importantly, I'm going to be talking about a voxel-wise random field theory approach, which we typically do not use because it's, we'll see, it's really conservative. But the, um, the pieces that go into it that I'll explain also apply for cluster-wise uh, random field theory. So still helpful. Make sure you're ready for this. Do you know the difference between FWER, PCER, and FDR? Also, do you know how Bonferroni performs? Also, do you know if Bonferroni was voxel-wise or cluster, not clust-wise? Um, and I didn't explicitly say this, but you should have picked it up from the uh, lecture on that. So if you answered no, please go back and look at the different types of error rates lecture or the parametric approaches, the first part, the Bonferroni part for um, controlling FWER. Right, so we are going to talk about random field theory today, and this is a parametric approach for controlling false positives, as was Bonferroni. And all parametric means is that there's some equation and it spits out the p value. And you might be thinking, of course, there's an equation that we use to spit out the p value. Um, with Bonferroni, we use just the t distribution to derive our p values, and that's parametric because you just need to know the degrees of freedom and you're set to go. Uh, we'll see next time, or pretty soon, we're going to talk about non-parametric approaches, and that's when we don't have an equation, but we construct the null distribution. So anyway, parametric, you have an equation for your null distribution, so p-values can just be computed from that. Um, the random field theory approach, again, that I'm going to be talking about today is the voxel-wise random field theory. There are various... Um, types of random field theory, basically for everything I went over before. There's a cluster-wise version, there's a peak-wise version, and there's a voxel-wise version of random field theory. So the voxel-wise tends to be as conservative as Bonferroni, and we'll see that later. Okay, so here's the most important part. In this max statistic idea, we're going to use it today, and it's going to follow us into the non-parametric approaches. So it's common to use the family-wise, or to use the max statistic to control the family-wise error rate, and I will explain why. So the family-wise error rate is the probability of having a family-wise error. And a family-wise error, as we saw before, is when the null is true. So basic, remember the two-by-two two table that I've been showing you guys? So if we're in the first row of the two-by-two two table where the null is actually true, we want to control that upper left-hand corner, the number there. So that's this, um, one or more voxels being larger than our threshold u. So we're trying to choose u so that we can control this overall probability, the probability that one or more voxels exceeds that threshold given uh, the null. Well, if we want to control one or more voxels from being beyond this threshold, Instead of focusing on all the voxels, we can just take the biggest one. So you take the biggest voxel and you focus on it. So it simplifies the problem a little bit because now we're just focusing on one voxel. So that is the family-wise error rate. We are going to find some threshold u alpha such that the probability of the max voxel being beyond that threshold, being larger than that threshold under the null is less than alpha. So the trick is uh, finding the distribution for the max voxel. So that's what I'm going to show you today. I'll show you the parametric version of that distribution. So let's say we have it. It's no longer going to look like our, our lovely familiar Gauss Gaussian distribution, but it'll look something like this. And you find some threshold u alpha such that the upper tail probability is alpha, and then any statistic beyond this would be rejected. So same idea, we're just using a different di distribution and it looks different, it looks weird, right? We're not used to seeing this. So the way we get at that distribution is to use random field theory, or one way. And we focus on this thing called the Euler, not Euler, but Euler characteristic, uh, which is this chi sub u. So here this image is a slice of brain, 
And this topological map is representing the teeth statistic values over that slice. So here you have some positive ones, here you have some negative ones. And you can imagine if we apply some threshold and only look at the voxels that are surviving the threshold, you'll get these various images I'm showing on the right. So these are the supra threshold sets. If I have a really high threshold, I just have one blob. Lower it a little bit, now I have three little blobs. Lower it a little more, and I have even more blobs. Um, the other characteristic that's important with the Euler um, statistic is holes. So you can see when our threshold's really high, we have mostly one big blob with a bunch of holes in it. So the topological measure is actually the number of blobs minus the number of holes. And as you can see, if the threshold's high enough, this becomes really simple because you just count how many blobs there are. So this Euler characteristic has, luckily somebody's already done the work, right? So we're kind of recognizing, hey, well, if our threshold's high enough, um, you know, we can just count blobs. And this blob count actually has a distribution associated with it according to this Euler characteristic. So that's what this last part is. So just what I had on the previous slide, the family-wise error rate is the probability that our max voxel exceeds some threshold under the null hypothesis, which is the same if the max is above the threshold, then we must have one or more blob, right? The blob may only have one voxel, but probably has more, or it could have more. Okay, so that's how we get from here to here, and that's an equal sign. Now we get into approximations. So this first approximation is assuming our threshold is high enough that we don't have any holes. And if that's the case, then this probability, the family-wise error rate, is approximately equal to the probability that the Euler characteristic is greater than one under the null. It turns out this doesn't have a, a super sweet equation associated with it. But if we further assume there's never more than one blob, then that is equal to the expected value of the Euler characteristic. And this thing, we do have an equation for. So this is our parametric equation that spits out p-values. So we're approximating family-wise error rate with this equation. See, these wiggly equal signs mean we're making assumptions, and I would like to revisit those assumptions later. But basically, the assumption is that your threshold is high enough. So because of this, and I'll repeat this later, it's really important when you're using random field theory, I wouldn't lower the threshold lower, the cluster forming threshold, for example, than what the software specifies, because you might be violating this assumption. Okay, that and uh, we'll see in a little bit, the data have to be smoothed. So there are two important aspects of this. So I'm not going to go through the math. Uh, you can see the 2003 Nichols and Hayasaka paper or the Kyle and Worsley 2001 paper, which go more into this. I may later present a paper on cluster-wise uh, random field theory. I just have to see if I can find a good accessible um, paper for that. And I'm going to show you a simplified version of the math. And what you do need to know is the smoothness of your image. So you have to quantify the smoothness and technically you should be reporting it when you use random field theory. So here's the general idea. So again, this is the equation for our p-value. There's some mathy stuff that I'm leaving out. I will tell you all of this is known, just things that we plug in. Um, and then the volume, you multiply that by the volume. We know this, um, all of us can count voxels, so it's looking pretty easy, but then we have to divide by the smoothness, and it turns out that's a little harder to quantify. So what's the smoothness? How smooth are the data? So this is measured by something called the full width half maximum, which means you take a Gaussian distribution, go to the top of it, go halfway down and look how wide it is. I'll have a little Gaussian distribution later where I can show you this. Since we're in three dimensions in our brains, we have a full width half maximum in each of the X, Y, and Z uh, dimensions. So the idea is if you start with white noise, white noise is going to be really jagged, and you apply a Gaussian smoother as we did to the data in the Bonferroni example last time. So if you want to see what it actually looks like to smooth data, you can go back to that code and um, the MATLAB code and look at it. 
And so the idea is you start with white noise and smooth it with a Gaussian and you have to find how large the variance of the Gaussian needs to be such that the smoothness matches your data. This is just a hand wavy uh, description of how this is done, but that's the general idea. Importantly, this is not the smoothness that you applied. So if you used a five or six millimeter uh, full width half maximum to smooth your data during a pre-processing step, that's an underestimate of your smoothness because your data have already been smooth. They've been smooth, they are smooth just generally. They've been smooth during reconstruction. They've been smooth during motion correction. Um, anytime uh, during registration, interpolation is smoothing your data. So it's important that you don't simply plug in. If I used a six um, millimeter full width half maximum to smooth my data, that is not the answer here. It's not six, it's probably something bigger. So Keith Worsley quantified this or coined this, the RESL, which stands for resolution element. And the RESL is simply the full width half maximum in each direction multiplied together. So, and that gives us a, a measure of the smoothness. So this is, in that equation, it's the RESL. The RESL count is if your voxels were the size of a RESL, how many voxels are required to fill your volume? So if you have 10 voxels and a two and a half voxel full width half maximum smoothness, that means you have four RESLs. Let me show you in a little picture. So this little Gaussian that's kind of hanging out back here, the arrow here is illustrating the full width half maximum. You go to the top, you go halfway down, and then the width of the distribution is the full width half maximum. So if we use that as our ruler and remeasure the space spanned by our 10 voxels, we get that our wrestle count is four. So that's what a wrestle count is. The wrestle is the product of these full width half maximums in the X, Y, and Z direction. Right, so you might be thinking, uh, putting this together with the Bonferroni that we looked at last time and Bonferroni was too conservative. And you might be thinking, aha, I know how to fix Bonferroni. I'm gonna use the wrestle count. But it turns out the wrestle count is not the number of independent tests. So this is not the magic bullet for a better Bonferroni. And I believe it's that 2003 uh, Hayasaka and Nichols paper, they looked into this. Um, they actually, it was one of the things they tested. Um, it's just a re-expression of the volume in terms of smoothness and we need not, well, we, the Russell count is helpful, but we need Russell's to calculate the p-value. That was the smoothness. So going back to this thing, our little equation for our p-value, let's make sure it makes sense, right? So sometimes I think people see equations and they're like, ugh, equation. But you can look at it and just see if you can gain a little bit of intuition from what you know and connect that to the equation. So that's what we're going to do here. So um, the smoothness again is defined in wrestles, not wrestle count, but wrestles. So this is the product of the full width half maximums. So let's first think about volume. So before we look at the equation, just think about volume. How, how do we need to, if you think about correcting your p-values as kind of penalizing them, uh, penalizing the voxel-wise p-value to adjust for the multiple comparison problem. If you only had two voxels, you wouldn't have to have a big penalty, right? You only have two voxels. But if you have 100,000 voxels, each of the p-values for all your voxels, you're going to have to uh, make all of them larger, right? So penalizing a p-value would be to make it larger. And sure enough, this equation makes sense. As the volume increases, our p-value, which is this equation, will increase. Okay, so that makes sense. What about the smoothness? So again, the smoothness is um, the, the product of the wrestles, not the wrestle count, but the wrestles. So the product of those, uh, sorry, the full width half maximums. So if our data were really smooth, um, this is gonna be really big, right? So that will shrink the p-value because our multiple comparison problem is worth. If our data are so smooth that all the voxels have the same data, then we don't even have a multiple comparison problem. On the other hand, if the data are not very smooth, our multiple comparison problem will be worse. So this number will be smaller, less smooth. So our p-value will be bigger because we're dividing by 
a smaller number. Right. So random field theory adapts. For larger volumes, it's more strict. And for smoother data, it is less strict. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Shortcomings of random field theory it requires estimating some parameters. Importantly, a lot of, I know SPM and FSL automatically, they have the smoothness estimation built in. Um, one of the criticisms that I've heard for AFNI is that it's kind of up to the user to do that. And I think it can be really misleading and you might think the right answer is to put the smoothness you applied, but you have to estimate it. Um, plus you actually have to apply smooth, you do have to do that smoothing of the data. If your data aren't spatially smooth enough, random field theory isn't gonna work well. Again, this is voxel-wise uh, our random field theory and it does really horribly. And this example, this is a glass brain, this is what SPM does. It's a really confusing view because um, it's as if the brain was glass. So this looks like it's, I don't know, where this looks like to you, but you have to kind of look at all three of these together to figure out the placement. Anyway, who cares about that? The point is um, Bonferroni random field theory actually kind of match up here and you end up with five significant voxels with both. This is just an 11 subject study. Um, but again, rest assured, we use cluster wise random field theory typically and works much better. Okay, so voxel-wise RFT rarely used in practice, too conservative. Cluster-wise is very common, and uh, we'll learn about cluster stats within the permutation testing framework. It's a little easier to uh, visualize it there. FYI, if you're using random field theory, you shouldn't lower that cluster forming threshold from whatever the default is, because remember, the Euler characteristic was assuming our threshold was so high um, that we could just count blobs. And if you lower it, you're running the risk of adding in some holes. So you can increase it without any negative repercussions. And actually there is a paper with Tor Wager and some others. It's recent, I think 2013, and they actually um, talk about increasing that threshold. If you really, really want to lower it, what you need to do is switch to a non-parametric approach. So SNPM or randomized. So you can lower it, but you can no longer use random field theory. But since non-parametric approaches don't have the same assumptions, um, you can use those. So see, I told you not to do something, but I gave you a, an alternative. Uh, make sure you have that. Why do we use the max statistic for multiple comparison correction? That's not gonna go away. It's gonna come up again later. So make sure you understand it now and make sure you understand that dismal results I showed you, whether that was voxel wise or cluster wise. Thank you very much. Please join the Facebook group. There's the link, uh, Mumford Brain Stats, and have a great day.